After many years of uh, teaching Form 3 biology students, I can say that osmosis is one of the more confusing topics, unfortunately. And it doesn't need to be that way because it's quite a simple process. Um, but the experiments that involve osmosis sometimes involve numbers and some simple arithmetic and therefore some students find that um, uh, find that a little bit challenging. In order to understand osmosis, we need to um, understand well the components of a solution. So imagine you have a glass of water with some sugar in it or some salts in that water. What do we have? We have a solution. A solution is made up of two components, solutes and the solvent. The solvent is, in many cases, liquid water. It could be something else, but usually in biology we talk about uh, water solutions. And the solutes are the dissolved substances, such as sugar or salts. So a solution is a mixture of solutes dissolved in a solvent. Now, the more solutes there are, compared to the solvent, the more concentrated the solution is. So, when we say a concentrated solution, we don't mean a solution with lots of water. We mean a solution with lots of solutes compared to water. So, let's imagine we have four different solutions and we are going to put uh, more and more solutes uh, in each solution. So the solution to the far right is going to have the greatest amount of solutes compared to solvent. The less solutes there are compared to the, to the amount of solvent, then the more dilute the solution is. So a dilute solution is a solution which has few solutes compared to solvent as compared to another solution which has much more solutes for uh, a unit amount of solvent. So if these four different beakers have the same amount of solvent, then the one furthest to the right is the more concentrated solution and the one furthest to the left is the more dilute. We use these two words, dilute solution and concentration and a concentrated solution, in order to compare the concentration of solutions in biological situations. So, for example, um, uh, we have a cell in water. Like many microbes, they live in water, they live in aquatic solutions, in aquatic environments. In this situation, the cell membrane is a very special membrane because it's semi-permeable. It allows water through, but not salts. So imagine a cell in water. If this cell is surrounded by just a cell membrane, then it's a semi-permeable membrane. It will allow water through freely wherever it wants to go, but it will stop any sugars or salts from the water, either inside the cytoplasm or inside the surrounding water, from going in or out of the membrane. The cell membrane is semi-permeable. The cytoplasm is a solution and the surroundings of the cell are also is also a solution because the cell is always surrounded by some kind of solution. Cells even in our body are surrounded by a solution. Cells of other living things are also surrounded by their own solutions inside the body or inside um, or wherever they live in the environment around them. Water behaves in a special way when two solutions of different concentrations are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. A semi-permeable membrane is a membrane, I repeat, 
that allows water through but blocks the passage of solutes. Sugars and salts cannot travel by diffusion, cannot cross by diffusion through a semi-permeable membrane. The membrane would have to be fully permeable for solutes to cross such a membrane. But a cell membrane is a semi-permeable membrane. So let's say that two solutions, A and B, are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. Let's say that solution A is more concentrated than solution B, so solution B is dilute. What happens is, on its own, water molecules will go through the membrane from the dilute solution to the concentrated solution, and a much greater number than the number of water molecules that will go to the opposite direction. This is osmosis. Water, when it's um, divided by a semi-permeable membrane and the concentration is different, will always move from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution. Remember, solutes cannot move by diffusion through a semi-permeable membrane, but only water molecules can go through a semi-permeable membrane. Now, even though it looks as if the water is moving uh, in a strange way, this is a special case of diffusion. But it's only specific to water molecules. So when we talk about osmosis, we always talk about water molecules moving through the semi-permeable membrane and not the solvents. Sorry, and not the solutes. The solutes cannot cross the semi-permeable membrane and they will stay where they are. So let's say that this cell is immersed in a dilute solution. For example, uh, a unicellular amoeba is placed in distilled water, for example. What happens is, by osmosis, water will flow from the surroundings of the amoeba into the amoeba. So if the amoeba doesn't remove the excess water, it will expand. It will expand because it it, it, it's going to absorb water by osmosis from its surroundings. This absorption is not done on purpose. It happens on its own because osmosis is a passive process. The cell doesn't do it on purpose. Osmosis is a passive, uh, non-living, non-energy requiring process. On the other hand, if a cell is placed in a concentrated solution, water will flow out of the cell because the water always flows from areas of dilute uh, solutions to areas of concentrated solution so in this case even though it's the same cytoplasm it would be dilute compared to the surroundings such a cell would shrink because it would be losing volume from its cytoplasm now let's see what happens to different cells when they are immersed in different solutions, in solutions of different concentrations. So, let's imagine animal cells. Animal cells are cells that are only surrounded by a cell membrane. So, they're only surrounded by a semi-permeable cell membrane. Animal cells do not have a cell wall. The semi-permeable membrane of an animal cell will allow water through by osmosis, either to the inside or to the outside, depending on the relative concentration of the solution surrounding the cell to that of the cytoplasm. If, a, if an animal cell is placed in a dilute solution, then as we have seen already, water will flow into the cell by osmosis. Such an animal cell will expand initially because it, of course, um, would be absorbing water by osmosis from its surroundings. An animal cell doesn't have a cell wall. A cell wall is rigid. So without a cell wall, an animal cell eventually would burst. And of course, uh, it will die in the process of bursting. A burst cell is dead. Just in case you were wondering. A burst cell by osmosis is what uh, is what would happen to our own body if it's placed in a dilute solution in a, in pure water for example it would absorb water by osmosis and unless we remove the excess 
um, our tissues would swell. If the solution on the outside of the cell is at the same concentration as the cytoplasm, then there is no change. As much water flows in as much as it goes out. Therefore, there is no change in size. There is no size uh, differences uh, be between the beginning and the end of such an experiment. The cell, if placed in a concentrated solution, would lose water by osmosis. An animal cell would shrink. Its cell membrane will become uh, shriveled and its cytoplasm would have lost a lot of water. The size of the cell would decrease. This is what happens to animal cells when placed in solutions of different concentrations. The story is rather different for plant cells. Plant cells, besides having a cell membrane, also have a cell wall. A cell wall is made up of cellulose, which is a strong, rigid material. But it's fully permeable, so it's not going to stop the water from going through. However, the cell membrane of plant cells, just like the cell membrane of animal cells, that will only allow water through. It will not allow any sugars or salts into or out of the cell. So let's see what happens to three plant cells placed in three different solutions of different concentrations. I'm going to draw simple plant cells with a nucleus and a vacuole. No chloroplasts here because they're irrelevant to this discussion. So the plant cells have been immersed in these three different solutions and let's see what happens. The first cell is placed in a dilute solution. For example, in distilled water. Such a cell will, of course, absorb water by osmosis, just as it happened before um, to the animal cell. The animal cell, if you remember, bursts at the end when placed in pure water because its expansion goes on and on until the cell membrane cannot take it anymore and it simply bursts. A plant cell, however, will never burst if it has a cell wall, because the cell wall is rigid. It will stop the cell membrane from, from expanding more than, a certain ex more than a certain extent. So the vacuole will expand and it will take up all the volume of the, of the cell, basically. But the cell membrane will not continue to expand indefinitely. The cell membrane will expand until it reaches the full size of the cell wall and it stops expanding. Of course, a plant cell placed in a solution at the same concentration will, um, will exhibit no change in shape. But a plant cell placed in a concentrated solution will shrink a little bit, but also the cell membrane will detach from the cell wall. From most parts of the cell wall, the cell membrane is not attached. So at those points, the cell membrane will detach and it will take up a smaller volume than that of, of, of the cell wall. We call such a cell in this situation plasmolized. The vacuole of such a plasmolized cell is shriveled and very small. A turgid cell, on the other hand, is this plant cell when placed in a dilute solution. So it's saturated with water. Here we can see on top cells which are turgid and cells which are plasmolized. If you're wondering, these are onion epidermal cells. When leaf cells are turgid, a leaf will be rigid and strong. It will have the greatest surface area available exposed to the light in order to perform photosynthesis. If leaf cells, however, are plasmolized, the leaf will wilt and not a lot of light will be exposed to the leaf when it's wilted. A wilted leaf is uh, 
not saturated with water and therefore suffers from a low rate of photosynthesis. Therefore, it is beneficial for plant cells to be turgid. It is beneficial for plant cells to be saturated with water. They will have a greater leaf surface area exposed to light for photosynthesis and they will also be stronger, so they will be able to uh, support themselves in a better way and any wind or any, any contact from moving animals will uh, be counteracted by the strength of turgid tissues. Now let's take a look at a typical investigation involving osmosis that all level students do at some point during their course. So usually some kind of tissue is used to investigate osmosis. A typical tissue would be potato tissue. Now potato tissue, as you should know, is a type of plant tissue of course. A potato is cut and cylinders are cut using a cork borer. Now these cylinders are, can be measured, can be measured in terms of their length, their length can be me measured using a ruler or their mass can be measured using a scale. Let's say that their mass is going to be measured for this experiment. And let's say that Whoever was preparing, preparing these potato cylinders was very precise and as it should be, the initial mass of each potato cylinder to be, to be um, treated in different solutions was exactly of the same mass, 2 grams. These different potato cylinders are given a letter A, B, C, D, E and F and each potato cylinder is placed at the same time and for the same amount of time in a solution of a certain concentration of sugar. So in these six different test tubes, a different concentration of sugar solution was poured. The first solution had no sugar, so it was distilled water, zero grams of sugar for every 100 milliliters of water. B, C, D, E and F had an increasing amount of sugar placed in them, dissolved in them. Let's say that the concentration of the sugar solution in, in the beaker, sorry, in the test tubes from B to C was 10 grams per 100 milliliters, 20, 30, 40 and 50. So that's the concentration of the sugar solutions from test tube A to F. After an amount of time, say two hours, three hours, the potato cylinders are recovered from the water, dried, dried by patting them onto a tissue paper, for example, and then their mass, their new mass is measured. The mass changed in all of the potato cylinders and the final mass of potato cylinders A and B showed an increase from the original, while the mass of potato cylinders D, C, E and F decreased from the initial mass. The fact that potato cylinders A and B increased in mass means that water was absorbed by the cylinders, of course by osmosis. The cylinders placed in solutions C through F had their mass decrease because water was lost from such cylinders due to osmosis again. So we can conclude that in A and B the solution was more dilute on the outside of the potato cylinders compared to the cytoplasm of the potato cells. Whereas in C, D, E and F, the surrounding solution was more concentrated than the cytoplasm of the potato cells. Therefore, while in A and B the direction of water was to the inside of the potato cells, in C, D, E and F the direction of water was the opposite 
from the potato cells to the outside, and therefore the potato cells lost water, hence lost mass. Now, this is where some students find a little bit of, of, of difficulty in calculating percentage changes. When calculating the percentage change, in this case, in mass of these different potato cylinders, you have to find the difference in mass by subtracting the initial mass from the final mass and dividing that by the original mass. And the formula is therefore difference divided by the original. So if we do this calculation for all the potato cylinders, we get the following results. 0 0.5, which is 15%, is the percentage change in mass of A. 5% is the percentage change in mass of B. The percentage change in, of mass in C, D, E and F is a negative number. Minus 5, minus 15, and minus 20, respectively. That's because of the mass lost. So, a percentage change in which the number is positive indicates a mass increase. Whereas, a percentage change in which the number is negative, the percentage is negative, indicates a mass decrease. So, we didn't change the way we are subtracting the numbers in order to get the difference in such a way that it always becomes a positive number. No, we always subtracted the initial mass from the final mass. And that is the way that you should always do it. Let's put these uh, percentage changes in our table. So, plus 15% for A, plus 5% for B, minus 5 for C, minus 15 for uh, D, minus 20 for E and F as well. Note that there was no difference in the percentage change in mass between E and F. That's because of all the water that was already lost in solution E, uh, was already lost in solution F and therefore the potato in solution F couldn't lose any more water than the potato cylinder in solution E. Let's plot the sugar concentration and percentage change in mass on a graph. Plotting these two numbers on a graph will show us the relationship between the concentration of the surrounding solution and the percentage change in mass. In order to determine which factor to place on which axis of the graph, we have to determine which factor is dependent and which factor is independent. The independent factor or the independent variable is the variable that is changing independently of the other. So it's not being affected by the other factor. In this case, the sugar solution, because of course the sugar solution was determined by the experiment, by whoever did the experiment. But the percentage change of the potato cylinders depended on the solution concentration. So that's the dependent variable. The independent variable is always plotted on the x-axis, while the dependent variable is always plotted on the y-axis. In this case, our y-axis will go below zero as well, because we have some negative numbers to plot. When plotting the points in a graph such as this one, it's useful first to plot the points, for example, using simple symbols like a plus sign or an x sign. So at zero uh, solution concentration, the percentage change was 15. And there, there's our point. At 10 grams per 100 milliliter concentration, the percentage change was plus 5. Then at 
20 it was minus 5 at 30 it was minus 15 at 40 and at 50 it was minus 20 after plotting the points we can join the points using straight lines now of course you, you always follow the instructions of your teacher or the instructions written on the examination paper but usually in such an experiment we tell students to join the points using straight lines and doing so reveals an interesting an interesting point at the intersection of the line with the x axis gives us the concentration of sugar of sugar solution at which the percentage change in the mass would be zero so at approximately 15 grams of sugar in 100 milliliters of water if we had placed a potato cylinder at that solution concentration there would have been no change in mass so there would have been no net osmosis no net flow of water either to the inside or to the outside of the cells